didn't see you. Uh, welcome back. Uh, we're here today with Charlie, uh, Charlie Musser. We're going to be talking about this and that, but we were just talking about this week, Nancy Pelosi, demented old dinosaur, mummified hag in a bag, uh, was Go confronted. <laughs> she was confronted. Just get in back her to China, all right? <laughs> she, she was confronted in her driveway. Uh, I think it was her driveway about, you know, whatever, stance in Gaza, Palestinian rights, blah, blah, blah. And of course, what was her response, Charlie? Well, she was claiming that uh, we need to investigate, the FBI should investigate all these anti-Israeli protesters because that they are Russian influenced, Chinese influenced. And then she straight up told the people at her driveway to go back to China. <laughs> And then, like, cowers into the vehicle and is like, it's like hissing yeah. as she drives away. Yeah, but this isn't the, this isn't the first time she's made these kind of comments, though, right? Is it? When's the when's the last? Well, just recently, yeah, where she's just losing her mind about this. I mean, uh, Miss, who's in the past, it's about the last twenty years, over half a million dollars that she's received from pro-Israel lobbies. Whoa. So, <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. not a surprise that she's back off. You know, you know, what trips me up is that uh, she's a Democrat and the Democratic National Party right now is all about these wars and all about continuing to fund these wars. They're like and, the Republicans and, in the 90s. Exactly. For whatever 80s, reason, 90s. things have changed <laughs> and the, the military industrial complex switched over to this. Part. I mean, they've both been under. Well, not, the, they're both in it together completely. Now. Right. They neither uh, of them can ever break free from it. Because, I think it actually. Yeah, I think it is an illusion, though, that uh, that the parties are different. I think that uh, they're very much the same in the policy, because when you look retrospectively at the bombings, closer and closer, and closer. <laughs> I think they're they're virtually identical in the foreign policy thing like they're out there just bombing whoever they can for whatever reason they really make up but uh i guess but things have changed you know henry kissinger even said i don't understand anything about the foreign policy these days it seems to be aimless which he was like the <laughs> king of you know <laughs> killing people indiscriminately so because that was for the good of anti-communism or whatever right whatever weird now this is all thing. just for Lockheed, General Dynamics, L3, Boeing. Uh, yeah. Who else we got? Yeah. Raytheon. But Raytheon. What what uh, what I was getting at too is that uh, it's it's kind of bizarre that well, first of all, they're going against their own constituency about all these wars. Forty nine percent of all Democrats don't want to be involved with Israel right now, but also the whole Russian disinformation thing. Like, of course, Russia is spreading disinformation, but this has been sort of a tool that the Democrats have been using this entire time to say, well, anybody who's critical of what we're doing is a Russian. Yeah. It must just must be. Yeah. Prepared. And this is what, and this is what she said the about the spreading the disinformation. <laughs> this is what she said about uh, the protesters recently also, I think either about Gaza or whatever else, that they must be paid by Russian, by Putin. You know what I mean? Yeah. This is crazy. <laughs> I, love, I I saw a meme that was great. Dude walks up like, y'all are getting paid? <laughs> yeah. yeah. When do, when do I get my check from Putin? I'm still <laughs> waiting in the mail for it. Shit. Uh, you know. But I mean, it's the same. It's the exact same thing, just different words. It's fake news. Like, it's all just, yeah. you don't agree with me, so what you say is fake. Yeah. Did you ever see this uh, John Stewart show where he interviewed all the European countries and asked them if they would support him in, like, war or whatever? He was trying to get allies and stuff. Did you see this episode? Of... I didn't see that, no. Uh, he's basically going around. He talked to Mick Wallace. I got to interview Mick Wallace. And, and everybody says, you know, oh, because he's speaking out, he's anti-war. He must be a Russian bot. Or he, he's like <laughs> paid. But, and I asked him he point blank. I, said, bot. <laughs> <laughs> I asked him point blank. I said, are you, you know, now or ever been paid by? He says, if they were supposed to write me a check, they must have got the wrong address because I didn't get <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unbelievable. M member of European Parliament. Um, 
Mick Wallace, cool guy, speaking out against genocide when nobody else is. But uh, so what? So what do you? What's your take on the uh, the election coming up right now? And everybody who's in office, do you think that <laughs> the two party system is going to be adequate in providing us with? You know, well, it'll be I, adequate in performing an election that's presented as if you have a choice between shit and my hand. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're very good because you can't, they, they control the debates, the two parties, they control the debates, they control what goes on TV, they control funding, they control who gets to be put on the ballot in every state. And it's, of course, it's made presented as if, oh, anyone can just go in here and do this. It's all just been a sham becoming more and more, which is what so, infuriates me. Of course. And so you, Charlie, you walk into the voting booth and you've got all the people that are currently on the ticket. Who you vote for? Lots of winners. Jeez, right right now I I have no one to vote for because, I mean, we've got Joe Biden and Trump are going to be your two for – Front runners. Your only two choices. Has the Green Party announced a, a candidate yet? No, the, but I, I peace think and freedom and all these people, which well, you're, never, you're never goes anywhere. Well, you're assuming that the nominations are already in the bag, and they probably are. You know, Biden probably be there, but Cornell West sure could definitely. Cornell West is running. Do you know who Cornell West is? Yeah, he's ran. Did he? He ran before as vice president of. Uh, What's her name? Jill Stein, right? Oh, I think so. Yeah. Mm hmm. I think that election, I actually did vote for that ticket. Really? So, uh, See, I, uh, if I, I had to vote Jill for Stein somebody, <laughs> well, not to out oust you there. Sorry. Now you're out. You're out of the Jill Stein closet. Everybody knows. I am. I, um, Jill Stein, who I would not vote for again, but. <laughs> wave that flag, boy. There we go. I found this in my yard. <laughs> See, we're patriotic Americans it, here. This is the way it should be flying because our country is in distress. Utter peril. Mm -hmm. um, so what else is on the agenda today? I know there's a few news stories that you got burning inside you. What else did we want to discuss? Well, here's what, what I've had on my mind a lot is Burkina Faso, which we oh, just really? touched on a little bit last week. And the alliance of the Sahel states, which have broken away from the... E-C-O-W-A-S, which let me get ECOWAS. ECOWAS, which is a it's a block of African nations, you know, it's for trade and commerce and things like that. So these three governments, which all three are led by military juntas now, and all three are former French colonies, they have left ECOWAS for saying that. ECOWAS has failed them in fighting the insurgencies against ISIS and the other terrorist organizations that are in that area. And so in the same week that this has happened, Russia has donated 25,000 tons of wheat to Burkina Faso. Mm. Last month, they reopened their embassy for the first time since 1992. And Russian troops have now been spotted landing in Burkina Faso. And that's all just this week, pretty much past month. Interesting. Uh, I just want to let everybody know, uh, ECOWAS is, you know, Benin, Burkina Faso, Capo Verde, uh, the Ivory Coast, Gambia, Ghana, Guinea, Guinea Bissau, Liba Liberia, Mali, Niger, Nigeria, Senegal, Sierra Leone, and Togo. So it's a pretty good little organization, pretty good click there. And so uh, we've got Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger leaving ECOWAS okay. altogether. Now, was this uh, something that was kind of brought on by Western powers to try to, you know, establish free trade? ECOWAS? Yeah. I do not know who is the founder who founded ECOWAS. Hmm. Uh, says addressing security issues has established a free trade and common external tariff. Because um, that's yeah. 
these these three countries, Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso, they're all landlocked. So they need ports and they need and they need trade in order to export anything. Mm. I mean, given the uh, history of American imperialism going in and uh, instilling certain governments in certain, you know, mineral rich areas, it's, it wouldn't be a surprise if uh, some of these some I would of these organizations France had something to do with it um, because a lot of old French colonies, the French military just left a lot of these countries uh, within the past couple of years. Okay. And which is why now these military led countries are aligning with Russia and the Wagner group for okay. to, to take on, uh, who do we have there? We've got, uh, the JNIM and the and ISIS in the Greater Sahara, the Islamic State in Greater Sahara, um, who just 2023 are responsible for at least 7,600 deaths. And uh, mm. there's been a lot of so, for instance, Mali, we have just coming out that there's a report at least 500 people were extrajudicially executed and involved. This was done by foreign non-French speaking white men and the Malian military. Wow. So, which they say, they're saying it's Russia Wagner group people. Okay. Yeah. This sounds like mercenaries, which is the current we, we, in America, we call them military contractors, but yeah. other peoples, we call them mercenaries, people that are paid for to kill. Right. But they've also openly been brought in by these countries' governments, which have just, they're not publicly elected governments. They're controlled mm -hmm. by the military, and the people have no say in who is controlling their country right now. Yeah, and speaking of Wa the Wagner's, the Wag Wagner group, Wagner's, uh, they are some of the most brutal homeboys on the block. That even their own kind, when one of their own mercenaries sort of defects and runs away from the group or whatever, uh, they catch him and they kill him with a sledgehammer. That's yeah. how they. That's yeah, their sledgehammer thing. is like their big thing, right? Yeah, not a great way to go. <laughs> great song. <laughs> bad what, bad way peter, to die what's peter gabriel have to say about all this <laughs> um yeah so the you it says here the united states had some influence on the economic community of western african states ecowas and it expressed support for ecowas and had it been involved in discussions related to trade and investment cooperation with the organization so it also had ties to the U.S. Agency for International uh, Development that you said, which you said is definitely has a history. We'll go into in another time about um, uh, misusing funds and working with the CIA in secret and, you know, helping to overthrow governments under the auspice of international development. So um, but according I, to this, culture, eco, what's that? Providing culture and technology, and, you know, right. Spreading Alexis. democracy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, according to this, not so not so good. It looks like the U.S. was directly involved with ECOWAS and it benefited them. And so this new arrangement is obviously going to be something something much different. And so, but we've got that's the problem that we've got now. We've just got war mercenaries landing in these places. We've got just another came out recently that the uh, who is it? Human Rights Watch has said that the Burkina Faso government targeted three separate. Uh, it was a funeral and two markets with Turkish made drones killing. Uh, who knows? 30 civilians in one area, 60 civilians in another. Hmm. And this is a drone, which is like the best, most precise capabilities. They know exactly where they're landing that thing. And that the government has done this to three different sets of people claiming that there was terrorists in these crowded places. Meanwhile, sure. just killing a ton of civilians. 
this is the classic w way to do it or say that they're human shields or whatever you have to say in order to kill civilians because the name of the game is terror and humiliation and and population decrease i mean the, i'm assuming the places that they hit were places where people might be against the um the government or, or what have you, the, the, the dissidents or whatever. Sure, symp sympathetic to a different cause. Yeah. And I tell you, in those situations, the first people to go are the professors, the students, the academics, the uh, artists, musicians. The moms uh, that happen to be walking through the market that day. Innocent women and children. Sure. Um, and this is what happened in Gaza, too. I mean, or like on October 7th, when they stormed even Hamas, I'm not, it's terrible what they did, because what they did was went to a music festival and killed a bunch of left leaning people who might have been sympathetic to their cause, instead of attacking the more right wing aspect of the government, which is a lot more racist and genocidal. So it's a shame. So well. What so? What is their next move? Do you, I know that uh, they've foiled so many coup attempts in Burkina Faso right now. Are they? Do you have any information on whether or not they're doing better than they were? Uh, no, because right now it's still a fourth of the children under five have stunted growth. Um, Three million people are in a food shortage. Um, so Russia is giving them twenty five. This is 25,000 tons of wheat when Russia exports, I think, 45 million tons of wheat a year. So it's, here's a little bit, take it. And mm -hmm. I don't know if 25,000 tons of wheat is going to feed 3 million people. I mean, how much, how much does 25,000 tons of wheat equate to in terms of feeding a population? It how many people and how for how long let's say a pound of wheat flour can last you maybe two weeks a kilo so for of three million people in a food shortage is that going to make a dent only temporarily maybe but yeah three million probably not and who's well, getting how... where is it going to how is it distributed as well? Yeah. You know, a, a big a big problem with a lot of aid that we give out is it's not distributed well, and sometimes it's hoarded by countries. In the, you know, mm -hmm. when Bob Geldof uh, played in the in I forget if it was his Live Aid or one of these kind of things, World Aid. Uh, Bob Geldof threw a big concert and tried to raise money for uh, these oppressed people, and the grain or whatever it was got sent in but it was being hoarded by the terrorist group and doled out, you know? And so this poor guy went to all this trouble to uh, be political and uh, use his platform and ended up just getting embarrassed on the world stage and tried to confront like Margaret Thatcher about it and just did not go oh. well. Oh, Margaret, you can't mess with her. The okay. iron lady, the woman with the iron box. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Burkina Faso has recently strengthened its alliance with Russia, particularly in military sector, following the withdrawal of French forces to the country. This has led to the increase in military cooperation, including discussions of training Bur Burkinabe soldiers and uh, officers in R Russia. So they're even talking about planning uh, a life together. They're getting married, folks. Um, and Russia's building a nuclear power plant there, too. Which, why did it take us so long to do that like we could have built these people nuclear power plants could we have not but why would you there's no profit in it is that the, that's the real answer well, right i'm asking what their excuse is who burkina faso or the u.s the u.s why the u.s uh if russia can come in and do this on a dime what took the usa so long i don't know you tell me i, I just don't they didn't have a reason to go in there did they they didn't need it. Why would you help someone when you don't need them or their land or their labor? Why, why bring up your potential enemies in a, in a country with a blossoming population? Why would mm. you offer them the same sort of advanced infrastructure and modern comforts that you would have because you would only be um, increasing the amount of competition? You want to keep the competition sure. under, <laughs> under your thumb. Of course. So yeah. there it is exactly. 
under my thumb is a nuclear power plant. <laughs> just send Mick Jagger in there to just he'll always... he'll he'll clear it up. <laughs> you could power an entire country on his uh, you know hip sex appeal. Yeah, his hip thrusting <laughs> and finger waving. No, <laughs> no, that why that was not Mick Jagger. I don't know what that was. That's good. That's close enough. <laughs> Maybe at this age, I think that's Mick Jagger's cat. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um yeah. The United States never built a power plant in Burkina Faso, but Russia certainly did offer to build a a plant right away to meet its energy needs. Um has an energy de- deficit already in Burkina Faso. It's only 21% of its population is connected to a power source. So they basically when mm-hmm. the sun goes down, it all goes dark. Um Better start and, the bonfires going. Right. The agreement with Russia is part of Burkino's plan to achieve 95% electrical access to urban areas. I mean, that really begs the question, is America that fucking evil that we, the whole time, totally could have built these people, being the number one economy in the world, that we could have actually, you know, used some of that money to actually develop some nice things for them to have and you got to wait until Putin comes in. It's really weird because even this sort of thing, when you go in and you say, Hey, I'll build your port. That's a form of power. Anyway, it's not, it's not going in there and killing everybody and enslaving them. That would but be hard power. over a portion of land. It's being leased for life. Sometimes portion giving up these portions of land that are sure. Yeah. <laughs> to what the U.S. and that particular country need to do in order right. to make it in, a, in the type of global trade capitalist market that we have. Right. And this is what happened with the Suez Canal. Now, it was, bought, it was made in the 1800s, but it was an agreement between the British and the, and the Egyptians saying, hey, you get, would you help us fund this little project we got going on? You can get your boats through there. And so they both said, okay, let's do it. Uh, Egypt fell on hard times, decided that they had to sell a portion of the thing to uh, France. And then, you know, a few decades later, they go, hey, you know what? We want our we want our land back. We want the port back. And so they just sort of nationalized it. Mm-hmm. And uh, so there is that aspect of it. But at the same time, if Panama you know, Canal too. what's that? Panama Canal, too. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, so there's like good things, but soft power is certainly better than hard power. If you're gonna oh like give people it. food, I so, like I like I like it soft, just man. Give people food, yeah. All these people just want <laughs> handouts. <laughs> Can't you? You can just hear them right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you can't put on your bootstraps and go get yourself some goddamn dinner. Go and get yourself up my bootstraps. <laughs> here, here comes my alter ego. My alter ego's name is Hickory oh, Tritt. Hickory coming out. Hickory Tritt's coming out. <laughs> uh oh, y'all better look out. A uh, Hickory Tritt's on the scene. I'm be talking about some politics up in here. Don't want to be giving no burkinos, no free food. Free Burkina Faso. I think that translates to R- Russian troll. No, I <laughs> I wish Burkina Faso nothing but the best in their, you know, struggle to be free. But I hope that they don't fall into the wrong hands well, on some other like, level. I feel like they already have. I mean, I'm not a Burkina Fasoan. So. Yeah. Well, here here's the thing. <laughs> sure, it's how- being run by the military hunters. I don't think ever worked out. It's not ideal. But we've argued this before, whether authoritarianism has its place. And I would argue... In some... Well, we could tie in El Salvador now. Okay, sock it to me. So the president of El Salvador, immensely popular, he has imprisoned... How many people? Let me get the exact number. Um, El Presidente, they call him. Yeah, how many people imprisoned in El Salvador in the past few years? Oh, this was where, because the MS-13 gang is from there. Yeah, so he made this big old crackdown on gangs. And so 
I can't find the exact number of how many people he's put into prison in the past few years. Hmm. It's been it's been quite a bit because it was the only way that they could get but, the so, crime under control. Now you so tell. Here's where you tie it back to him. Oh. So at what risk or at what forms of rights are you giving up in order to get your country safe? Right. And and for every like you can't rehabil- rehabilitate poverty, and it's really hard to say w- w- at what point does criminal justice absolutely become necessary because it seems to be already overused in the Western world. Uh, but in some cases, you you have a lot of disaffected. Like there are dogs that need to be put down because they will always bite you because their life has been <laughs> nothing but shit. Following you completely, right? Right. So there has to be some r- realization about like. I could get to a point where I would be just so incompatible with the rest of society that I would probably need to be put down. And for, for God's <laughs> sake, please put me down. Um, but uh, so President Naib of El Salvador has overseen a significant increase in the country's prison population Manodura. since March 20 to, 2022. The iron they call him Mano Dura, the Iron Fist. Oh, shit. I mean, Salvadoran authorities have arrested more than 72,000 people on suspicions of being gang members. The country's prison population has tripled to a total of 100,000, which represents 1.6% of the population. Um, so he locked up almost 2% of the population. And the prisons um, are gnarly. It's like prisoners like have their heads on each other's backs and they're all just like on the ground like this, looking down like unclothed. Like It's pretty wild. Yeah, I mean, as you as you could imagine, prison in El Salvador to be right, it's a miserable fucking place. Yeah. It ain't a it ain't a summer camp. Um, I mean, what's your thought on it? Is this ethical, or do you think that some people are going to be swept under the rug? Well, the problem is that people apparently already are being imprisoned without just cause. And there's innocent mm. people that are in there with these dudes that are stuck like this You're right. all day long. Because um, here we've got... Uh, uh, there's an article about Santos Arevalo, a 53-year-old agricultural worker who used to be an avid supporter of the president. Um, he voted for him first time around. But then his son was accused of being a gang member and arrested. His son has spent more than nine months awaiting trial, and he's not allowed to access him, so he hasn't been able to speak to his son. Okay. And he you doesn't know, know the... if his son's even alive. Crazy. See, so and a this lot guy of... says his son was not even a gang member. So Yeah. So uh, this happens in New Orleans. I was just talking to a, another friend of mine. They have Napoleonic law in New Orleans, which means the summons are fill in the blank and they can. And what they do frequently, because they did it to my friends, is they come along before Mardi Gras and and arrest all the street kids uh, and lock them in jail and keep them and make them disappear to where I go and ask if where's my friend. I went down to the jail and said, where's my friend? They said, Mm -hmm. you better get out of here. You're going to join your friend here shortly. Right. (laughs) There you go. Um. (laughs) It's it's really scary. Uh, in in El Salvador, yeah, a bunch of these people are potentially innocent, and the detainees haven't even been sentenced, so they haven't even been convicted of a crime. They're still awaiting trial. Which well, and I think he just passed the the government just passed a law to where they can do these big sweeping trials of like nine hundred people, and they can just all at once say, "All right, nine hundred people guilty." So no one yeah. actually gets a specific trial of any sort. Yeah. Uh, that's not exactly great. Um, but I don't know. You know, Mao drove all the landlords and redistributed all the land to all the peasants. But to do it, he had to kill a bunch of people and, and chase the rest of them to Taiwan. Millions um, and millions, right? Yeah, the Black Book of Communism says 100 million, but uh, I think that's exaggerated. I don't know. Is it? <laughs> it is. Well, a lot of- 
let's say 20 million tops, but 100 million is the high estimate that is usually embraced by Western scholars as the feel good story of the year. But no, you know, there was there was problems with land reforms where he got the Soviet agronomist uh uh, Lyshenko. Lyshenko came through and had these stupid ideas about growing crops, and that's why they subsequently had famines in Soviet Republic, and then, you know, years later in the same Soviet China. It's because they listened to the same guy for a little too long. Um, but other than that, yeah, diversion of grain shipments and stuff like this also. And just the gulags themselves, how many people cannibalized each other in the frozen tundra of siberia will never know that's the same thing you get from we're talking about these grain exports from russia to burkina faso right same thing there in communist china back in mao's day still hoarding of resources not distributed extortion like what have you yeah so this is but power at any level you're talking about uh I, oh, would you say President Iron Fist mm -hmm. of El Salvador? I mean, he's done some other things where I, I heard, I watched a whole interview with the guy. He he's seems okay. Down, he's brought down the homicide rate by an incredible amount to where. Yeah, what was to, the homicide it, rate? According to these figures, El Salvador now has the lowest homicide rate in Central America, did it say? Yeah, I remember reading something about this. Let me see the how. Um, uh, under the president, Iron Fist, Iron, Iron, Iron Fist, <laughs> Iron Fister, <laughs> uh, a significant reduction in the homicide rate in 2015. The country had a staggering homicide rate of 107 per 100,000 people, making it one of the most dangerous countries in the world. And that was true. I remember that. However, by 2023, the homicide rate had fallen to 7.8 per 100,000, representing a remarkable decrease. So that's pretty epic. That's a pretty epic drop. But again, some of these things become political where, too, where the way where, you count it. Yeah, where are the numbers coming from? Because I'm, if I'm not mistaken, are those numbers done by the government run? It's done by police. <laughs> It's done by police, right? The police yeah. report it to the political uh, arms of the government. And then and they... we all know that the police always tell the truth. Well, the police always tell the truth. 110%. He had a knife, or I, at least it looked like a knife. And so I had to put 72 bullets in him and reload the clip and empty 72 more. Um, then yeah. chop off his head. She was. She was. So, but... On the whole, though, it looks like El Salvador is doing pretty good. At least you pulling can, themselves out of the muck. You can. And so, where do we? Where do we? Where do we draw the line then? How many? On, yeah. In in I'm I'm talking about in terms of incarceration, in terms of rights that are given up of some people for others to flourish. Yeah. And essentially, if you do send somebody to prison, you're not really uh, rehabilitating them, especially in the Western world, if in this global South, global North. If you send somebody to prison, you're basically turning them into super criminals because it's what they call con college. And organ you... donors. Sure. Oh, God. Unwilling Almighty. organ donors. And or unwilling sperm recipients, too. Uh, <laughs> No, but have you uh, heard of all the, the unmarked graves they've been digging up in Alabama, Mississippi, where oh, yeah, people yeah, getting yeah. Their, their relatives' um, bodies returned with their organs missing? This was <laughs> in prison, right? Uh-huh. Now that's disturbing. When you start talking about a, uh, uh, organ trafficking, because, you know, Israel got caught doing this in the 90s that they were taking the skin and the organs from dead Palestinians' eyes and stuff like that. Um, and the one Israeli doctor, I think it was, admitted it. And then they just dismissed him like, oh, no, he's just lying. He's or whatever. just a crazy old kook, right? He's a kook. Mm -hmm. That's a ripping so, skin. Let me ask you about this. What was the deal with the the 
Speaking of Alabama and prison, what was the deal with this execution? Oh, man. The first nitrogen gas execution in the history of the United States of ever. What? Been. Sounds uh, pretty brutal to me. I wouldn't want to go that way, although I, you know. Uh, so what did we got? We got this man was actually, they tried to execute him once before. They tried to give him lethal injection. They couldn't get a vein. And so the death permit or whatever they call it ran out. So they didn't have time to execute him. So this guy was actually on the execution table two times. Um, no psychological trauma at all, you know, to just be sitting there waiting to be murdered by the government. <laughs> uh, so it was an experimental execution because they, they can't find the drugs to get lethal injection anymore. So they're trying new ways to kill people. And this yeah. was the nitrogen gas where they put a mask over this guy's face, take out all the oxygen, fill it with just nitrogen which they said was supposed to make him pass out in a few seconds and he would be dead within a minute or so, they said. Uh, it took him 23 minutes to die. Or 23, something like that. Jesus. Uh, apparently the, the people witnessing the execution said he was thrashing around. Uh, involuntary movements is what they called it. Yeah, I wouldn't call that a peaceful death. No, sounds pretty horrifying to watch, to be done to. I mean. So you, I'm against all form of capital punishment because there's no sense in sending somebody to the grave that you have no idea what you're actually sending them to. But I don't know, maybe catch me on an off day. Maybe I'll, I will have it so much, you know, fed up with humanity. I might change <laughs> my mind. But, um, well, for yeah. me, for me, the problem with, execution especially is I mean sure the execution part that's pretty horrifying but to be sitting there and knowing the, th the thing is humans that we have we don't know when we're going to die most of us we don't have like a time clock like alright at 323 on May 17th you're going to croak but to, I cannot imagine the torture that would be going through knowing alright Counting down the minutes here, counting down the days to when they're going to put a nitrogen mask on me and end me. Like that <laughs> sounds like torture and like that's the cruelest form of torture and punishment there could be. Yes, I agree. I mean, you talk about pricking your balls at the same time <laughs> the whole time that you're in that jail cell. Consciously, but, I mean, every breath becomes as sweet as pie. You know, you're just like, oh my god, I know. But yeah, so this is psych this is psychological torture. Mm -hmm. So he was convicted of capital murder in 1988 for a murder for hot plot, a uh, murder for hire plot involving the killing of a preacher's wife. Mm -hmm. um, he was With sentenced to death. Fire, I believe. I I guess I don't know. Well, it was so the story was he was hired by a preacher it was the preacher's wife who hired these two guys to come and kill his wife for insurance money mm. um so there was two of them one of them already was executed years ago and this the guy who was executed the other day claims he was the the other guy killed it and he was just there watching and a jury actually said that he should get life in prison not the death penalty and the alabama judge overruled them and gave him the death penalty, which has actually become unconstitutional now. Um, yeah. It's since 2017, I want to say. I, I, I am, I am in really scared of the Alabama sort of governmental system, like Louisiana as well. It's like the prison systems down there are the most crowded and worse off. The police are the most corrupt. The judges are the most corrupt. The people are the most uneducated. It's the food is being harvested by slave prison slaves <laughs> there's like three times as much sugar and preservatives in the food there than there are on the west coast um people are just in rough shape and it's just like a free-for-all down there and i've hitchhiked through there and it's it's scary what happens there's a correlation between people in alabama and uh 
the, there's a correlation between the most religious states and the ones that take the most pharmaceutical drugs like fentanyl, antidepressants, and 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 Ritalin, or you know your whatever you know ADD medication people are taking nowadays. Um, yeah, Alabama the sort of got a real nice hold down there too. Yeah, I mean you know who to take advantage of, right? Yeah, God. Uh, but yeah, this dude was totally executed, nitrogen gas for uh, for the for his crime. And you know, you were mentioning about why they can't find this drug anymore that kills people better, faster, more efficiently, more humanely, or whatever ethical slaughter. Uh, yeah. And the reason is the company that makes it is like French and they just don't want to give it to them anymore because they say, yeah. we're not going to give you a bunch of toxic to kill these people. That's the last time. Someone's, someone's taking a stand, I guess. Well, somebody's, <laughs> somebody's got to. It's nice. I mean, maybe it's just not profitable. <laughs> could be. That could be the story. I'm surprised that they don't do bring they'll bring back something even more grotesque like the guillotine or the firing squad but i don't know would i mean not that there's any great way to be executed but the guillotine seems like all right boom like a second of pain I, this guy suffocating for 23 minutes doesn't sound very yeah uh... I remember they taught me that in school about how they used to kill people in the Middle Ages and they would come with a dull <laughs> axe. And they, and like, explain, I'm like in third grade, they're like, and they would just keep going and it would take all day. And sometimes you'd have to leave and then come back the next day to have the job finished. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, well, the, the guy who invented the guillotine, I think he has this quote like, Are you saying, well, I'm just trying to give them, even in death, the best that I can offer or something. <laughs> Let's see, see if I can find the highest that. quality. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, us here at guillotine and associates. We believe in, <laughs> we believe uh, in enriching the experience of execution by making it an enjoyable and quick experience that, uh, <laughs> the behead E will enjoy fun for the whole thing. Fun for the whole family. If you're going to plan your last moments, do it with a guillotine. <laughs> That's the guillotine promise. I'm not just, I'm not just. Those a, guys over there in electric chair industries don't know a thing. <laughs> I'm not just the CEO. I'm also a client. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we need the sound effects. Yeah, we're going to bring the next week, folks. We're going to have the sound effects to punch up all the sadness in the world. We're going to have like, boing. The, gu the guillotine comes down, boing. <laughs> <laughs> if you're uh, going to execute me, at least make the guillotine make funny noises. That's uh, all I ask. Well, you won't have much of a choice on anything at that point. No. Um, I several countries have, have been criticized for the use of the death penalty, especially developed countries here. So, Amnesty International says countries such as China, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Arabia, the United States have all been identified as having high numbers of executions using methods that are Iran, deemed... Iran just executed four Kurdish uh, guys the other day. What was the crime? Oh, you know, like being alive. I don't know. What was their crime? Uh... I think you're right. I think it was probably just being Kurdish. Yeah. Oh, you're Kurdish? No, nope. it's they were uh, they had entered Iran from Iraq's northern Kurdish region. Now this is I don't know if I believe this at all. You still using Google? You should use Perplexity. It's way easier. Um, I've got lots I, of I've got other ways. I've got other ways. I've got other ways. The Kurdistan <laughs> is a special place because it's um, two non-consecutive sort of autonomous zones where uh, the Kurd people live and they're really hated by other people in Iraq and Turkey and, and Syria. <laughs> but the thing is, they're the most developed, most reasonable, civilized people in the region. Not to say that, you know, other people are more primitive, whatever, but they really do have good infrastructure and good education. And I've, I got drunk with a, a Kurd on a <laughs> on a German train and he was awesome. We went to Hamburg and 
struck up a friendship and uh, we didn't understand a word each other said. He made me drink some kind of strange yogurt drink when uh, and uh, eat some kebab and stuff. It was quite enjoyable. So shout out to my Kurdish friend out there. And to all my Kurdish friends as well, who I haven't seen yeah. in a long time. Yeah. So that's the story there. Um, so what, why did those guys get, did you, did you find out what, why they got? Uh, supposedly sabotage, alleged, alleged links to being Israeli spies. It's all bullshit. I'm just going to yeah. now. That's about all it takes. I mean, there's a fine line between a, a terrorist and a freedom fighter or a, you know, activist and a dissident. There's a fine line. And so we've got Iran, Iran hanging people on yeah. the rig. We've got China. I don't know if they still, I think they still have their mobile execution vans that they, oh, they drive come, out to the villages. Uh, it's, like a, to it's, a, it's like a masseuse. <laughs> I brought the table. Rub your, rub your feet just a little. Lethal injection, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, firing squads and lethal injections. Yeah. Yeah, That's, see the, and you know what? I've defended China in the past in various occasions, and I I always say, well, the United States has more people in prison than any other country. But the truth is, China executes a lot of people every year, um, and a lot of and, people that are in prison that's not reported, and and a lot of them are drug related. So if anybody smokes a joint in China, that they just come and inject you with poisonous chemicals and kill you, <laughs> like yeah. you're some kind of, you know, defective piece of shit. Um, well, I remember, I remember, ooh, I remember trying to get weed in China. Are you serious? Uh, now, this is a story. Terrifying. Charlie gets weed in China. What was that like? <laughs> well, I mean, it's because, it, you know, they could, they could straight up kill you for it. So you can't get flour. They only have big brown balls of hash that people have probably been able to smuggle in their butts or something. Jesus um, Christ, Charlie. Do you know how stupid you have to be to smoke hash in China? Right. So you risk your life to get stoned off a drug that makes you more paranoid. <laughs> that sounds horrible. <laughs> Cannabis is illegal in China. The country strictly prohibits marijuana under the PRC criminal law, while industrial cannabis hemp is is legalized in the Yunnan province. It's strictly regulated. Oh, the in possession, Yunnan, really? Yeah. Uh, the possession... Um, they made waves, then. Yeah, the possession of marijuana is subject to severe penalties. Uh, they may face, well, you may face detainment, fines, and a varying degrees of prosecution with strict, strict enforcement. But I would think that if you're dealing, that's more of a, a, a that's an execution. execution. Okay. Same with Singapore. Singapore has some really strict uh, drug laws. Well, and what else? The Philippines under Duarte. Oh, yeah, he went on his big rampage too. This was again going around and executing, you know, joint smokers. Yeah, and not actually dealing with the big, you know, guys that are making money off of it, controlling the gangs and the violence and the drugs. Oh, that's really interesting. You brought that up. Singapore is actually has some of the strictest drug laws in the world. Get this: the Misuse of Drugs Act classifies substances into three uh, categories: A, B, and C, and imposes severe penalties, including long prison terms caning and capital punishment <laughs> staining's got to be <laughs> they, I mean, they got to bring back caning dude if you everybody go google a picture of modern singapore and tell me that doesn't look like an advanced nation and then i'll tell you I think they'll they'll cane you if you spit on the ground or chew gum right <laughs> is that <laughs> true too <laughs> i think that's true that was like an old wives' tale how, about Europe. I don't know how strictly enforced it is, but I think you can be caned for chewing gum in Singapore. I think chewing gum should be a caneable offense. <laughs> ah, just cane him. Oh, you know what's funny is that, that it's not illegal in Singapore, but it has strict regulations on its sale and import. <laughs> it's like alcohol and well, they thought they thought in 1992 they passed a thing that said the improper disposal of it is like I'm going to be a big I'd deal. Stick it on the bus seat or something. Lock, yeah, lock cylinders, oh. subway doors, elevator buttons. So that's uh, a cane. That, that's a cane worthy offense. <laughs> that's a bad one. 
<laughs> like, I wonder what the cane looks like. Is it just like some old guys in one of those old wooden like ones? No, just you know, eh, I think or... it's one of these like it's like a reed, like a real thin it's piece got of wood. Ridges on it and crap. <laughs> probably it's probably looks like a cutting board. You know, it's just like <laughs> Jesus. No, I, I mean, you can't, it can't be good, right? Uh, the law creates presumption of trafficking certain threshold amounts, such as 30 grams of cannabis. Um, so if you get more than 30 grams, they'll say that you're trafficking and then they'll give you the death penalty. Mm. And again, is that, is that how you keep the numbers down? I don't know. But Doesn't I mean, seem. come on, you're going to, you're going to kill somebody for bringing in 30 grams of weed. Well, dude, some people really believe that uh, cannabis is this horrible, horrible thing. You know, you know, the great Christopher Hitchens, this author, famous thinker. He's one of the greatest minds of the 20th century. Where Christopher Hitchens, his his older brother is a conservative Yahoo, and he really believes that cannabis is one of the most destructive drugs and known to man. And these are bright, you know, well-to-do academics and stuff. And so, yeah. So some people are just off their rocker on the whole thing. I mean, it makes me a bit stupider, but I'm telling you, you don't want me <laughs> off my medication because I'll fucking... Same. <laughs> Leave my fucking mind. We all have to get through this thing Sorry called life not. somehow. <laughs> so what else is on the docket today, Charlie? Oh, God. oh well, let's get to our big story here. Amazon okay. and Mississippi. Ooh, I heard about this. So get fill me in. So we've got Amazon is opening. What is it? It's going to be like a data center in Mississippi, to where Mississippi. they're being tax. They're they're tax exempt. The whole thing is tax exempt. So what do we got here? What are the numbers specific? We've got. Uh, the project is supposed to bring one thousand jobs to the state. With a salary of sixty six thousand dollars, um, two hundred and fifteen point one million local public infrastructure commitment has been made, mm -hmm. which breaks down to uh, what do we got? Our numbers here: forty four million dollars of taxpayer dollars, Mississippi taxpayer dollars, is going to build this thing. Uh, they're taking out a two hundred and fifteen million dollar loan. And Amazon is giving a permanent tax exemption. Permanent? Permanent, or is it 50 years? Let's see. Uh, the state is committing to a 10-year, 100% corporate income tax exemption, along with incentives for sales and use tax for construction, as well as investments made 12 months post-construction. Amazon will receive a rebate of 3. 15% of eligible construction costs and a 100% exemption for sales and use tax on equipment. Lastly, there is a 30 year rolling state tax exemption. In the event Amazon continues to make the annual minimum investment of 500 million and hires 50 additional jobs, those tax benefits could be extended. G. Willigers. I mean, tax Math. avoidance. The tax avoidance schemes already that Amazon has been criticized for. I mean, uh, it says here reported that Amazon avoided about five point two billion in federal uh, income tax on its record, thirty six billion in pre tax income for the fiscal year. Uh, they don't. They're not interested in giving back to society whatsoever. They want to become society, and all the people are worried about the government overreach oh the government and you know too much taxation nobody's talking about you we're talking about this guy where with that amount of taxation you could definitely um have it so seniors have free senior home care for all old people um instead of letting private equity firms slowly buy them all up um, and so how many how many jobs is it supposed to give is it sixty six thousand, or was it less Oh, great. So people can piss in jars and hustle back and forth until they ultimately oh, okay. become redundant. And they actually voted down. They wanted to make it at least that 25% of the workforce would be Mississippians. And the Mississippi government axed that one. 
So it doesn't even actually have to be any Mississippi residents. Okay. That will be the, employed at this thing. So they're going to import convicts from El Salvador, make them work, <laughs> and ship them back. I mean, they go to really great lengths to not actually give people a fair working wage and stuff. Well, and this is Mississippi. Mississippi is the poorest state in the union. Right. So it is the great forgotten uh, part of the United States. Uh, Yeah. And so, I mean, they have been already, you know, eventually they're also going to be all, automatic anyway like you're going to become redundant at some point so those jobs so giving amazon a 25 year tax break aren't they are isn't everything going to be robotic in 25 years i mean the rate of technological change is exponential right now so it'll be just working delivering packages totally the data by 2030 it's estimated that 800 million jobs will be taken by ai and uh, we've all seen the, you know, videos of the DARPA robots that can deliver packages and be knocked over. And like, we already have Seven Eleven things that, you know, that deliver food. I've seen them in Moscow and New York City and L.A. where uh, in you Phoenix, put... I saw one that was like cleaning up trash and it was like supposed to be a police robot or something. <laughs> I... <laughs> That's it. It's going to be Roombas with guns. <laughs> that Roomba in the junk. Roomba in the junk. Yeah, it's a bunch of Roombas with fucking uh, weapons <laughs> attached, which is going to be what it is. You They're did gonna... not place in receptacle bin. Death penalty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you put a number two plastic in a number five container. Death penalty. <laughs> It'll be instantaneous, it, too. It takes 25 minutes for it to chop you in half. Yeah, and then they send you off to the warehouse to be made into Soylent Green. <laughs> there it is. Ah, we that's found the, it. We've, we've cracked the code locked. of the future. <laughs> Charlton Heston comes out. <laughs> yeah, this is one good role he had. I love, I love him in that movie. From my the cool Omega dead Man? hands. Not so much. Yeah, uh, a few actually. Uh, Planet of the Apes. You, you damn dirty apes. <laughs> so good. <laughs> By God, from my cool dead hands. Um, so I, and I want to say, you were talking about prison labor earlier. Uh, man, there are, I like McDonald's, Walmart, Starbucks, Sprint, Verizon, all these people are using the prison labor. Come on. Uh-huh. Yeah. Coca-Cola, Whole Foods, Kroger, Target, Aldi. Yeah. Uh-huh. But in regard in regards to the um the uh Am- the Amazon thing, so that they've been tons of examples of corporations sticking their nose into education, culture, or politics through influence. And you were gonna tell me about What's the deal with Amazon? So they're building this thing in Mississippi. What what's the deal with the STEM? Like they want so part of so, it is what they're partnering with the state of Mississippi for a STEM education curriculum, which is to embed this curriculum within K through twelve community college and universities, basically all centered around going to work for Amazon. <laughs> It's what it feels like it comes down to. Training you in school to go work for Amazon. <laughs> so in the curriculum. So if Am- you're saying Amazon has its hand in sort of what kind creating, of curriculum? Creating, creating the curriculum for uh, so, STEM. So here's here's the actual quote. We've got Bill Cork, the director of the Mississippi Development Authority which said there's a two million line item with the institutions of higher learning to create positions that will engage the community to pursue careers in the associated industry. And this training will focus on STEM, which is science, technology, energy, and math, education, certification programs, and internationally renowned programs within the company's own operations. 
The process will consist of building the team, working with communities and the company to embed this curriculum within K through 12 schools, community colleges, and universities. Holy shit. I mean, for some people, that's not frightening enough. You have to connect the dots, but um, the corporation should have no say. Like if Ford gives a bunch of money to a school and says, yeah, but she, I'll give you the money, but you have to teach them about how to be good factory workers and teach well, them how Ford to be engineers. Ford has their own. Ford has the Ford Next Generation Learning. Oh, God. Which helps you form career pathways in Ford's company. It does not, but it does not give you choices. It does not say, here, explore what you think might be fun. It's training you specifically to be working for Ford. And that's what's going to lift you up. That's what's going to pull you up by your bootstraps. And, you know. I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps. My name's <laughs> Hickory Tritt, and I come from Alabama. Hickory um, Tritt believes in STEM education. I was born in Bogalusa. I was raised in Tuscaloosa, and I, I don't know nothing about no education, so I just let Amazon teach me everything I need to know. Teach me I'm Hickory Tritt. Four trucks. Four trucks. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's, uh, that's okay, because my grandpa was actually from Alabama, so I can actually use that voice. So, <laughs> fuck all of you. Um, uh, so, you're telling me that they're actually so this happened before i had somebody on the uh, show her name's katie worth she's an awesome journalist she wrote a book about climate misinformation and how exxon and chevron were sitting in in school meetings where where the the creators of the textbooks and they were getting to decide the curriculum in schools and they were asking certain names and certain vocabulary words to be stricken from the record and taken out, you know, because it's like this a might... nun in a Catholic school, like you can't say vagina. Yeah. Uh, no, you we can't, can't say corporate profits. <laughs> we can't say climate crisis. We can't <laughs> say capitalism. Yeah. It's, we can't say as far. So they actively had their lawyer sitting in on decisions being made by school officials and people writing textbooks to say, we want to carve the narrative here. Now, go check her book out. Her name's Katie Worth. Amazing human being. Amazing book. This is what I'm talking about. And so I wanted to rattle off because you brought this up. You know, in the 1990s, Coca-Cola and other food and beverage uh, corporations, they donated millions of dollars to school lunch programs in exchange for uh, exclusive vending rights. And it allowed them to put their... And to not tell them what was in their products either. Right. right. And this is part whole part of the thing. Yeah. Um, the practice allowed these corporations to control what students had access to, often promoting sugary drinks and unhealthy snacks over more nutritious options. This is a real thing that happened. PepsiCo has been criticized for the same thing, uh, incorporating its products into textbooks, particularly in science and math textbooks. For example, in some textbooks, students are asked to calculate the calories in a can of Pepsi or the cost of a Pepsi sponsored product. So it's advertisements right there in yeah. your book. That's fucking sick, dude. If you have three Cokes oh, yeah. and your friend has five Cokes, how many Cokes is that? It's like, come on. You only man. have one Pepsi. <sighs> yeah. Uh, this is the idiocracy I'm scared about. Uh, Disney. Also totally guilty. Educational materials. Disney has a long history of producing, um, like education materials, like textbooks, software, online resources. Um, and a lot of them were useful, Along informative. One of the most influential companies. For children. For the entire for, world, yeah. Right, for young people. Um, you, that's, this is where we're talking about corporations carving up our culture and telling us who to be culturally. You don't find that a bit like shallow and, you know, disgusting. Um, critics argue that this can create a sense of indoctrination and make it difficult for children to distinguish between educational content and commercial advertising. Yeah. No shit, Sherlock. No critical thinking. Um, because textbook, that's what's being taken out of all schools. Yeah. Well, they don't. Woke. They, that's the classic thing. That's what George Carlin said. He said, you know, they, they want an army of drones that just are just dumb enough to run the machines 
are just smart enough to run the machines and just dumb enough to accept, keep accepting this uh, ever uh, decreasing pay and pensions and benefits and stuff. Um, you bet you're behind. Uh, textbook publishers have been accused of follow, favoring certain view, political viewpoints and ideologies, as we discussed with the um, the uh, climate miseducation. Uh, oil and gas have been accused of, of attempting to sow doubt, uh, telling me something I don't know. Pharmaceutical yeah. companies have been accused of bribing doctors to prescribe their drugs, even when there are safer, more effective alternatives available. Um, just more corporate malfeasance, times when uh, corporate profits uh, were more important than the public good, or being honest, or being truthful, or being efficient. Or keeping people alive. Right, which has fallen rapidly out of fashion, I guess, um, keeping people alive. Ain't they too profitable. Another thing I did want to touch on, and I, you probably know about weapons manufacturers, uh, have actually worked in with using Hollywood films and video games to promote their products and glorify violence. This is a true thing that's happening. I want to cover this <laughs> in the future, but uh, there you go. There's a small list of um, similar similar all, things. All our friends at Boeing and Lockheed. Yeah. Shout out to y'all. Call of Duty is now brought to you by the AK-47. AK-47. And Do a school shooting. And Coca-Cola. Yes. <laughs> Nothing makes me th thirstier than a good school shooting, and I always reach for a cold Coca-Cola after I'm done. Oh, did the Supreme Court, the, the su Supreme Court, was it? Or somebody denounced the Uvalde Police Department. Well, good. Today. Did you, did you see those cowards hiding behind those? Oh, yeah. Thin Jesus. blue line. That's, that's the thin blue line. That one dude had a Punisher uh, image on his phone. He was holding his, and you could see, first of all, cops adopted the Punisher logo as if the Punisher doesn't hate cops. Yeah. Uh, and the, didn't the, the guy who writes or made the Punisher is like, no, this is the stupidest thing you ever could possibly do. You guys got it all wrong. A friend of mine, his name is Delete Laws. Shout out to my friend. He's a First Amendment auditor. He goes around and he screams at police and tells them that he knows <laughs> his rights and stuff. He's been arrested several times, but his videos are just fire. Like he gives cops such a hard time. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I don't. I don't have anything to say. Fuck the cops. Well, the theme. So here we got the AP is just that the police response was a riddled with failure. The DOJ, that's who it is. The Department of Justice report. That's what came out. That the Uvalde shooting was riddled with failures and that no, basically no one was in a leadership role. They apparently didn't even know there was an active shooter happening, apparently. Yeah. I, it's just... And, you know, that, and so my buddy, he says, you know, he he does all this uh, work uh, knowing the Constitution, telling people his rights and, and screaming at cops. And he says, you know, this thin blue line thing, what it does is it separates you and I from from the police. Like they think that they're somehow above, that they're not servants to us. That we, we, <laughs> our protect tax money and serve. protects and serve. Now, is that just rich people's property or is that everybody, you know? And And legally, it's true that they don't, they say they put they stop putting it on their cars because they there's nothing really written that says they have to do that. It's just like a motto that they they threw on their car, <laughs> like like all natural or whatever, just a low <laughs> branding thing to seem more cool. But in reality, when they put that Honk stripe on like boobs, <laughs> yeah, uh, could be just as effective. Um, that that thin blue problem. line. It's just bullshit. It just just says we we're, we're we're above any other responsibility other than to well, and it says ourselves. we're above prosecution, we're above questioning, we're above anybody that it's not us. And so. they're par parading around like they're a, a disenfranchised minority, like all cops matter or whatever. Like no, even though they receive the most public funding of any any. Any of any of our public sectors. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, doesn't get much more insane, does it? 
But then the moment you speak out against it, you become, well, you're anti-police. You just want all those rapists and junkies out there on the street. And what are you going to do when they show up at your house? You ain't going to call the cops, are you? Yeah, this is, are you? That's the contention of most uh, brain rotted suburbanites who live in isolation in their little white, you know, carved out communities that are separated by class where they don't have to empathize with anybody else and they can hold libertarian values like they think that their whole existence isn't predicated on the labor of thousands of people. Uh, it's a classic thing. I see it when people I know, I see it in my family members. They really have no idea that um, my cousin thought that homeless people were like the number one committers of crime, violent crime. I was like, this is not anywhere <laughs> close to true. <sighs> the suburbs are a scary place full of very scared people who have isolated themselves off for generations now and do not know how to interact with the rest of society. And they get all their fear-based propaganda spoon fed to them through the tubes of the uh closed circuit um television system <laughs> yeah they're HUD, they're huds yeah the newsletter says be on the lookout for black people <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I saw one he had a lawnmower yeah i don't know oh. what he was doing He's probably yeah, raping not... children with it the occasional Karen video surfaces where she's out there screaming at some poor Mexican who just wants yeah. to like cut the grass. <laughs> like, dude, I'm the plumber. What the hell? Yeah. Like I live four blocks away and I speak yeah. perfect. Go back to Mexico. <laughs> I'm from Texas. <laughs> but it's rampant. Like we sit here laughing about it, but it just it happens all the fucking time. Now, I guess we have to reiterate that the only reason we laugh at it, uh, any of this stuff is because we laugh to keep from crying. Uh, right. It's just a trick of people who are poor. I mean, when you grow up poor, that's the only outlet, man, is making jokes about it. <laughs> and it is. And it's funny in the way. Like, if, if a bunch of uh, terrorists just broke in my house and decapitated me and, like, tied my w wife up and burnt her with hot coat hangers for hours and hours, that would be the funniest, most hilarious thing. That is <laughs> comedy. That is, like, uh, the... That is human. Plastic. Yeah, that's the that's the most human thing. Mel Brooks once said, he said, tragedy is when I cut my fingernail, right? And I break a nail. <laughs> Comedy is when somebody falls into an open sewer hole and dies. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's true. I mean, life is hilarious in that way. It's the tragedy and the funniness of it all. I mean, what are you going to do? Um, but yeah, so what else do you want to cover? I think we're, I think we're nearing the end here. Okay. Well, we're going to be back next week with a fresh set of topics. If anybody in the chat has anything that they'd like particularly talked about, otherwise we're just going to be trying to cover, uh, you know, the latest and greatest developments in the decline of humanity. Right. And that everything is terrible and humans are terrible. Yeah. And we're terrible for laughing at it. So we're terrible for laughing at it, and we're we're just sitting here, uh, you know, sort of fiddling while Rome burns. We're like the band on the Titanic ship. We're just trying to have a good time while while it's all <laughs> chaos and screaming and running. Um, I want to thank my guest Charlie Musser. We'll be back next week. Uh, until then, don't let your meatloaf. <laughs>